Welcome to the final winter speaker series of 2024. We've had a real good run in this winter. Uh, David, come on up. You're going to introduce yourself a little bit through one of your slides, I know. But uh, tell us about maximizing the sale lifespan and uh, probably a few okay. other little am nuggets I, am too. I on here? So, yeah, I've been a member here for about 25 years, I think 24 this year. Um, quit my job as a teacher and uh, Spent the last six or seven years selling in Easter Caribbean with my lovely wife, um, and started working in the marine industry down south, um, working in marine upholstery and then sales um, on the boats down there. So yeah, I race a J30 here. So okay, so what we're going to cover tonight? Um, I'm going to talk a little bit just about how sales work. I know everybody knows how they work, but I want to cover a bit of that um, just because that's how we explain as they wear how they fail and stop working. So uh, how they're made, what they're made of, cleaning them, storing them, protecting them from the sun. We're going to talk a little bit about canvas and vinyl, um, how to check your sales, what to look for, and like I said, how to know when your sales are need work or when they're actually worn out and need to be replaced. I'm going to talk a little bit about recutting as well at the end. So that doesn't work. This one? Nope. Wrong way. Okay, so you probably know sails are a wing, just like on an airplane, and they work the same way. So a wing is a foil, there's different types of foils, there's uh, neutral foils like on an airplane, they're often either neutral, flat on one side, or concave on both sides. Yeah. Um, the type of foil on a sailboat sail, it's called a negative camber foil. I'm going to come back to this slide when I talk about what happens when sails stop working. So this is actually a picture, oh, that's nice and loud now. Good? It's, that's good? Okay. So that curve of that negative foil, that, that curve is the camber. And so most sails will actually have a camber line on it. I don't have a laser pointer. But you can see on this sail, there's a dark blue line down there, and there's three of them. And that's so you can visually see that shape in your sail. And that's what gives you that foil shape. And that's kind of how you tune your sail. The second measurement that we use, so that's the camber line. To kind of measure where that camber line is supposed to be, we use something called the cord line. So you can see here, now you can kind of, you can see that camber, that shape. Now typically we want that deepest part of the camber about a third of the way back from the luff of the sail. That's generally where, depends on the boat, the type of sailing you're doing, whether you're racing or cruising, but generally you want that camber somewhere in there. This is actually my sail. This sail is about 12 years old and you can actually see at the top that the camber is getting a little more neutral where that deep spot is getting a little further back. That's, that's an indication of where. I'm not quite ready to replace this one yet. So typically, sails are cut either cross cut or radial. I'm sorry, that graphic wasn't great. So the cross cut is just a straight slab cut. Most cruising sails are cut this way. A lot of the race sails are radial cut. Typically, 
the more panels you have, the smaller the panels are, the better the shape, and the longer it will hold its shape. The problem with that, of course, is that there's a lot of labor involved. Oh, I'm sorry, was it something I said? No. <laughs> so this, the fewer panels that you have, the better the shape you're gonna get. Back in the old days when the sails were made of uh, cotton and linen and things like that, they actually used to cut them in really narrow strips just so they could get better shape. What's that? No, it's okay. It gives me an excuse to walk around. So I'm a little rusty, I haven't done this in a while. I did ask my wife to look at the presentation before I started and get her suggestions. Um, her suggestion was just make sure everybody makes it to the bar before you start, so. <laughs> She's a wise woman. So typically our sails are made out of a woven fiber, woven fiber, uh, polyester, typically Dacron. Dacron's a brand name. Um, but most of the cruising sails are going to be Dacron. Um, race sails and high performance sails are typically made out of some type of laminate. I brought a couple of examples. This, I promise you, is all very important as far as the care of your sails go. So this is typical. This is five and a half ounce Dacron. And I'll hand this around. You can actually see this. And I found this actually in the shop the other day. This is kind of interesting. So both of these panels, they're both five and a half ounce Dacron. It's the same fiber. And I'll hand it around. You guys can have a look at that. You notice the difference? What, what we, how would you describe the difference? It's very soft, yeah. So that's what we call hand. That's how stiff or soft the fabric is. So that's the same fabric. So what they do is they heat treat it, they put resin in it, they roll it, they press it, they do all kinds of stuff to it. And that's what makes the fabric stiff and good for using for sales. Because otherwise, basically, your shower curtain is uh, made of Dacron. It's the same thing. And it's just stiffened. Then the laminates, and nowadays they're making, I cannot even keep up with everything they are laminating together. If if it's flat, they're laminating it. Like, there's no keeping track. So, anyway, that one is your typical laminate, probably uh, carbon fiber and spectra. And then this one is a taffeta. It looks much like uh, Dacron. And you often see this in performance cruising sails. And this is probably a spectra cord that's in there. And then this is another, this is a clear laminate with a carbon fiber, also very popular. This would be typical in um, uh, foiling and uh, windsurfing. Very stiff, very, very strong. Now the upside with the laminates is that they never lose their shape. Hold on. Until they don't. When they do, it's kind of spectacular. So, you guys can have a look at those too. Pass that one around. So I just want to look at how, how they, these two materials break down. This is just something I've learned in the last few years of doing this. I've noticed um, they really do not behave the same way. So it's a consideration when you're buying new sails, whether you're racing or whether you're cruising or whether you're doing both, which a lot of the folks here at the club do, for example, you're probably racing and cruising. So it's, a, it's an important consideration when you're buying new sails and when you're thinking about maintenance. So the laminates,
typically as they age and they wear. Um, I'll back up a bit. The sail always gets stressed around its edges the most. That's where all the force is in the foot, the luff, and the leech. That's where all the stress is. And so a, a laminate sail won't stretch. Never, it will never change shape. It'll eventually just break. And what will happen is it will start to split along the luff and the leech, maybe even the foot, depending on the type of sail. It'll actually just start to split, and the sail will just want to go flat. It'll just want to flatten itself out. So you can see the example here. Now keep in mind that this sail has not been bent. And by bent, I mean it's not on the mast and on the boom. It's not properly mounted on the boat. But both the examples I'm going to show you are, have been kind of stretched out in the same way. So from their three corners. So you've got to get an idea. I don't know if you can see in the picture there how flat that sail looks. There's very little shape in the middle. It's not hanging down low in the middle. In fact, if you can see that, the edges, the luff and the leech, are actually dropping off, drooping over. So this is an example. This is a, this is a jib, I believe. And it's done. It's worn out. So even if you were to put this sail on your boat, it's going to be completely flat. And I'm going to get back to what, that's, what that means for your sailing. Now, Dacron, on the other hand, oh, I'm going to talk about fixing them as well. So this sail was actually, this is a laminate sail that came in. This was a fairly new sail. Um, and it had been stressed either in a, like it had been reefed in heavy weather, um, the halyard wasn't released. They pulled down put, and loaded up the, uh, the leech and split the laminate. So that's what it does. But because this sail hadn't started to delaminate, so those layers, if your hand is going around, what happens too is they, as they age, those, those layers come apart. They just they can't, they, they just do. Some of them are better than others and some last longer than others, but eventually they all delaminate. So this one hadn't. So this is the repair to fix those stress cracks. So the sail could be put back into service for a couple years. Now Dacron, Dacron will stretch. It's not as stretchy as cotton or linen or hemp, but it will stretch. It's not the greatest picture, but you can kind of get the idea. But the center now, if you remember back, that picture I showed you of the sail with the camber and the cord line and how that deepest part of the sail was about a third of the way from the luff, so the trailing edge near the mast. This sail's deepest point is right about there, right in the middle. And in fact, this sail is so stretched out that that, force of, that point of deepest curve in the camber has actually moved up the sail. So it's gone from about two-thirds of the way up to like almost to the top. So as it stretches, as it says, that deepest point will start have a tendency to move aft and become neutral. Now I'm going to go back to this cool graphic. I was actually online looking for cool graphics to steal off the internet when I found this one off an, off an actual research paper. And I ended up, you know, down the rabbit hole actually reading the research paper. And it was talking about the neg negative camber foil. And I always, you know as your sails get old, your boat's just not as fast. Right? Like, you know this, you can't point as high, the boat doesn't go as quick. But why? Right? Like, you can twist and you can tune the sail, but your boat just gets slower and slower and slower. What I didn't realize is even though you still have that wing shape, so you go back to this, this old sail, it's not ripped or anything. It's still wing shaped. But there's a point where this camber gets so far back and so deep that the airflow actually becomes neutral. And so what's happening is the air is now flowing off 
the inside and the outside of the sail at the same time. So that sail's no longer producing any lift. So yes, you can go on a beam reach, you can run downwind, but basically that's a downwind sail at that point. Right? So that sail will push you through the wind, but it's not pulling you through the wind anymore. And so this significantly impacts your ability to point, Uh, to point, what else? Oh, and winds. So when you, when you have high winds, you also want to flatten your sail. So if you have an awful lot of, if you have a lot of camber and that point of force is way back, you're also going to get more keel, which also slows your boat down. So that's the bat. So this is what we want to try to avoid. So the number one thing that damages sails, of course, is sun. UV is really hard. Dacron's actually really UV resistant, um, but it will break down over time. So this is a really interesting, this was a vintage race boat. The sail came in that sail was probably made in the late 70s, early 80s. Um, and the reinforcing patching in that sail was all Kevlar, pure Kevlar, like in a bulletproof jacket. So of course in the 70s and the 80s they were like, bulletproof jacket, Kevlar's amazing, it's, it's bulletproof, right? It's amazing. So they put it in the, everything. This is covered by Dacron. This wasn't exposed. This was covered with a layer of Dacron. But over time, the UV even penetration even through the Dacron destroyed the Kevlar. So the ring actually pulled out. It was this beautifully stitched in ring. It pulled out. And when I redid this sail, that Kevlar, when I went to take it out, it literally just turned to powder. It just like crumbled in my hands. I was going to keep a piece of it to, just to show, but it, uh, it just disintegrated. So over time, UV, sun, it's just going to break down pretty much everything. So it's important to cover your sails, either you know a, a sail cover um, or a stack pack. Um, or sew on UV if it's a Genoa. Um, you can put Sombrella. Sombrella is actually quite heavy. There are other options. There are other films and things you can put on, um, on head sails. There's a very light, uh, it's about a four and a half ounce Dacron that's been coated to be UV stable. Doesn't last as long as Sombrella, but it still lasts a long time and it's a lot lighter. So any one of these things, a sock, if you have a race boat and you have a furling main and you don't want to put anything on it, you can put a sock over it. It's a bit of an investment, but it is definitely cheaper than replacing your sails every two or three years. I had, um, I had a sail come in last year. Um, it was a young couple who just bought the boat and the boat had sat in the, on the yard for two years with the rig up and someone had rolled the Genoa up backwards so that the UV was on the inside and they brought it in and they, they sent me pictures and I couldn't tell what I was looking at. I said, can you bring it in? And we stretched it out and the sail was missing all through, like 12 inches in all the way around. It was just gone. And then it was the UV was, so the, the rest of the sail was just stitched to the UV, but the outer edge of the sail was completely dissolved. It just was missing. So that's two years. That's all it took. Because the other big one is chafing and luffing. So contact with the spreaders, contact with the lifelines, contact with the stays, even contact with the sheets, depending if you have uh, blue water boats and the ocean going boats. Um, the chafing with lines is often a concern. There's multiple sails and big sails. Control lines and stuff will often drag across the sail. They can chew through a sail if you're, uh, if you're cruising, if you're blue water cruising 24 hours, um, a line can cut through a sail pretty quick. So chafe protection is really important. Um, so we use Signet or Aramid, which is also Kevlar, um, depending on the amount of chafe you're going to have. So luffing is the other big one. So of course, when you when you're put your sails off the wind and they luff, all that flapping, that is wearing the sails out. Every time they luff, 
you are shortening the life of your, of your sales. And eventually what will happen is they'll fail along the, the uh, leech line. Sometimes the leech line will pull out. And you can see my fingers sticking out through here. So this, I don't know if you can see it in the picture, but this had already failed on the leech line. And then somebody had hand stitched a piece of Dacron on it to cover up the hole that had occurred. And what they did was they actually created what we call a break line. So they got a nice firm, you've actually made the fabric twice as thick, and now it even breaks down faster. So this is a challenge when we go to fix these because if we put a straight edge on, you're actually gonna speed up the process of breaking the sail further in. And that's what's happened here. And it's shredded it here. We can, we can fix that, but it's, there's a trick. You have one? Also needed. Okay. All right. So now we're going to get to the part about actually what to do with your sales. So this is a, not an exhaustive list, but the end of the season or when you're putting them up, these are some of the things you need to be checking or should check. So the first one, of course, is check your stitching. Your stitching might look okay, but if your sail is 10 years or more, you don't know. The, awesome, thank you. Make sure I, I'm not gonna wanna blind anybody. There we go, okay. Take somebody's eye out. Um, the stitching will may or may not, depending, especially along the edges of the sail, may not last the full life of the sail, especially in a Dacron cruising sail. Um, so it's a good idea to check them. I actually just use um, a hook like this, and I'll just put it under the thread, and I'll just give it a little flick. I don't pull hard, I just give it a little snap. If it's done, it'll just, it'll, it'll come apart. Um, I've had sails come in and they look fine and I've gone to drag them across the table and the head webbing just comes right off. And this has just come off the boat. So it can look okay, but you do need to check. And thus the webbing. Check the webbing, make sure it's on. You shouldn't be able to pull the webbing off by hand. But eventually you will get to, a, the sail will get to a point where you probably can't. But just check it, just grab it from the, where it's sewn onto the sail and just give it a little tug, make sure it's not gonna come off. Check your rings and your grommets, look for break points, splitting or separation around the grommet, especially in laminate sails. Check all your hanks, they have a tendency to seize or crack. Anybody here using stainless steel hanks? No? Okay. Um, the industry is definitely moving towards uh, stainless steel hanks. Uh, brass hanks are actually getting really hard to find. I don't recommend them. Um, anybody know why? You're close. Don't, sorry, I don't recommend stainless steel hanks. Thank you. Don't recommend stainless steel hanks. Why? I've got a free sail tie for anybody who can answer. <laughs> why, why are stainless steel hanks bad? What? Nope. What's that? Nope. Is it different, different metals against metals? Nope. It's the opposite. What's that? The stainless steel hanks are hardened stainless steel. It's the same material as your force day. So they will wear your force day out. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're not great. Um, slugs and sliders, uh, if you have plastic slugs, they sometimes will crack and they'll wear down. Um, sliders, same like your outhaul slider. Uh, check the webbing on them. 
so they can crack, they can split, they wear out. Your luff tape is a big one. So the luff tape is the, if you have a foil, if you have a furler, the luff tape, that's the little bolt rope that goes inside the foil. They wear very quickly where they go into the foil. If you're racing, you're taking the sails down, up and down every day. That top part of the bolt rope wears out really fast. Generally, it needs work every couple of years. Otherwise, what will happen is it starts to fray. If you ignore it, there's a great deal of loading at the head of the, for of the head sails, the top, and they'll rip and they'll pull away. And the worse that gets, of course, the harder it is to fix. But you can usually fix it with a little piece of uh, sail tape. Uh, batten pockets. Batten pockets are the other big one. Batten pockets fail fairly regularly. Um, I spent some time in the North Sales Loft in St. Martin, and they do all the warranty work for the really, really big super yachts. 100, 200, 300 foot yachts. And we had a boat come in, it had brand new sails on it, $5 million worth of sails. Um, had just come over from Spain, um, and the owner was on board and he wanted to sail the boat. So they sailed it across the Atlantic, $30,000 in damage to the sail. So one of the, the uh, mizzen sail on the boat had too much loading on the batten pocket and shredded the, fr the luff of the sail. So that all had to be rebuilt. But this happens if you have, especially if you have full battens, it puts a lot of pressure on the luff of the, luff of the head sail. So you really need to keep an eye on that and keep an eye on the tension on those battens because they, they, can, they can shred your luff in a very short period of time. Check your UV covers. Obviously your sail bags and stuff. A lot of people don't realize they look, especially the UV cover on your Genoa, if you've got say some umbrella and you're like, oh, there's a little split in it, but the rest of it is good. I can go another year. The problem is that little split lets the sunlight in. So you let it go for two years and then you bring it in to have the UV changed and guess what? There's a split in the sail where the split in the UV is. Almost always. So even if you just put a piece of tape on it, keep the UV off that, off that sail. Check your leech line and your leech. That's another big one. The, the, uh, the leech, the trailing edge, the piece that holds your leech line in is usually uh, done with really light fabric. It's usually five and a half ounce. So if you have, you've got a seven ounce or an eight ounce or a nine ounce main or Genoa, that, le that leech tape is still probably gonna be fairly light tape. And it often will fail before the rest of the sail does. And then of course your leech line pulls in. Same thing with the hardware at the bottom. Um, there can be a lot of loading on that. Uh, the Velcro. Velcro is not UV stable, so if, the U if Velcro that holds your leech line, if you have that type, um, and if it has any UV on it, the, the Velcro is just gonna break down. Headboard. Headboards, um, I had one come in this year where the headboard hadn't been properly tuned, but cleaned up in the loft, brand new, and it shredded all the webbing. So rivets can pop out. It's just a good idea just to have a look at it. Telltales, telltales, the little red and green streamers on your sail, they do not last the lifetime of the sail. They will wear out much quicker. They really, if you have yarn, it's probably gonna be changed every couple of years. Ribbon will maybe last four. So check those. Bolt rope, like the uh, luff tape, same thing if you have a bolt rope for your uh, halyard. You'll want to uh, check and make sure that it's not fraying or ripping. Um, if the bolt rope like splits or opens up, then of course it's going to jam when it goes up. And the more it jams, the worse it's going to get. And finally, your windows. Check your windows. Um, the window material typically doesn't last as long as the Dacron either. And even in the laminate sails, Usually the window material will fail before the laminate will. So we change a lot of windows. And the window splits, especially if you have a race sale or performance sale, um, that that's, that's window material is actually re usually reinforced with carbon fiber. 
So if it splits, you're actually changing the shape of your sail. Do you, a lot of people will tape it, but it's really not going to save the shape of your sail. So that's something you'll want to get dealt with sooner than later. Um, it's generally a type of mylar um, with a carbon fiber uh, cross-checking in it. I should have brought a piece in. I think I have pictures anyway. We'll see. So here's some of the examples. You can see here where this, this webbing was hand-stitched and it was barely hanging on. This is the webbing on a slug. That was a brand new sale. Right. Thank you, sir. I have a short memory. There we go. So that, that webbing, that was a brand new sale. Um, and here you go, like there's, so the person that asked me about, so this particular one, this sale, that's just uh, mylar. It's not reinforced. So it didn't last very long. You can use vinyl as well, um, but of course the vinyl stretches, so it's not great for sail shape. It's easy to replace though, and it's very cheap. And then a headboard. So this is a headboard off, uh, I believe it was an HH-66. So this is like a $20 million boat. And uh, they had a failure, again, at doing Atlantic crossing, and so they, they tied it on. And you can see here where the stitching is all let go in the webbing. So while you're doing your inspection, one thing I recommend is when you find something wrong, especially when the sail's up or if you got pulled out on the yard or something, mark any problems with painter's tape. Just stick it on. Um, if it's something technical, make a note on it with Sharpie. Stick it on there. Because when it comes into the loft and you're, you're like, okay, I got this little rip in the middle of the sail. So... It does, especially um, boat covers. If you've got little holes and rips in your boat cover, trying to find them again, even for yourself, if you're trying to patch them, it's really difficult. So, painter's tape. All right. Home repair, do's and don'ts. Do you sail tape? Sail tape is a really good way, <laughs> if you've got a rip, um, if you've got an older sail and you, it, it rips under stress, if you put some sail tape on there, that's going to stop it from ripping any further. Hand stitch, especially for webbing. Um, hand stitching works pretty well because you can, if you get, a, get yourself a hand palm, you can punch that needle through just about anything and you can control the length of the stitches, especially for webbing. Now be careful though, because if you've got really old sails, you'll find what happens is the webbing gets really, really hard. In fact, it can get so hard and impacted with dirt and it, somehow it breaks down in the UV, even the machine won't punch through it. So for me, I just strip those off and we put new webbing on, it's much easier. Um, but be really careful trying, if you're trying to sew that at home, you're gonna find that's really difficult and it's actually a bit, could be a bit dangerous. And of course, Feel free to bring your, you know, your sails to the loft. Be more than happy to look at them for you. What's that? Yeah. I don't, and by the way, I don't charge to look at sails. If you want to bring a sail in just for, to have a look at it, I don't charge to do that. Don't. Please do not try to fix your sails with duct tape. It has no lateral strength, so it won't stop the sail from ripping. And all it does is gum up the material. So it makes it really different, difficult to sew. The sewing machine really doesn't like the glue that comes off of duct tape. The other thing I don't recommend is using a domestic sewing machine. I know because I broke two or three in my early days. They really don't like, especially Dacron. It's really hard, the machine just isn't designed to punch through the Dacron. It also, the machines I use all have walking feet or pullers. So they, you have this huge sheet of Dacron and it's stiff and you need to pull it through the machine. So in your domestic machine, it can't do that. 
So what ends up happening is you end up with all these little tiny stitches really close together, and that creates other problems. And, you know, if it's your wife's machine, she's going to be really pissed. So this is an example of that. So excessive stitching will actually perforate the material and cut it. So to see this fairly often where somebody's tried to use their home singer to fix their, their own canvas or sails and actually end up shredding it. All right, cleaning do's and don'ts. I get called a lot about, I've got stains on my sails. This is a difficult thing and I actually, I travel a lot to, to learn because there aren't a lot of sail lofts in Canada anymore so I have to go to other places to learn. And this is a question I often ask, it's like what do you think about sail cleaning? Because there are places where you can pay to ship your sails and they will clean them for you. Um, from what I get, that is bogus. Um, you really can't industrially clean sails. Now that said, sometimes a sail will come in and it's cottage sail and you know a family of mice have perished in the sail. <laughs> and I, I'm like, uh, uh, yeah, no, that can't go inside. So what I'll do is I'll fill a garbage can full of warm water and you know a small scoop of OxyClean and I'll let it soak for a couple hours. So you can soak them in warm water. These are really mild soap or OxyClean. If you do have a stain, you can use a really soft brush to try to brush some of the stain out, um, but don't use a stiff brush. And of course dry them, hang them up, let them dry. One of the worst things you can do is put your sails away for the winter wet because then you're going to get mildew and mold. In some cases that mildew will actually eat the sail too. So don't, don't put them in a machine. Don't, some people are like, it's fabric, it can go in the sweat. I'll put it on gentle. I'll put it in with the sweaters, it'll be fine. Uh, no, it doesn't work. Uh, don't pressure wash your sails. I've seen people doing this. So. You have the fabric there? Getting back to that Dacron, those two different types of Dacron, if you pressure wash it, you're literally blowing the resin out of the sail. And then you're back to the, to the shower curtain. Don't use bleach, ammonia, or any harsh cleaners, spray nine, boat wash, any of those things. Don't get them on your sails. Any one of these things could break down, dissolve, remove the resins that are in the Dacron that make it stiff. And like, don't use your boat brush. Your boat brush is generally a very stiff bristle. It's really hard in the fabric as well. Don't use any heat and don't iron them. Somebody's like, how do I get the wrinkles out of my sail? Don't, don't do that. You once made a comment about removing glue residue. Yes. There's not, so, so when, if, if there's anything adhesive on the sails, like the leftover from the, uh, the sail numbers or signet, um, I use baby powder, so to make them not sticky anymore. There's really no safe way to remove that glue residue. Anything that's going to take that glue residue off is also going to destroy the sizing in the sail. And the same with laminates even. Unfortunately, the laminates are easy to clean. You soap and water, you can clean a laminate sail. There shouldn't be anything that's going to stick to a laminate sail anyway. So soap, very mild soap and water should do the trick. But anything that's going to remove that adhesive is going to damage that laminate. Which, so bleach, ammonia, and other harsh cleaner, ammonia especially. I'm going to get to that one too. Sizing is the resin and the process they use to make the, the fabric stiff. So it's the difference between those two pieces of fabric. So, and it might be a process of rolling and ironing and r resins and such. So it can vary. 
that's the problem is you never know which chemicals are going to affect which cell. So on to the uh, to canvas, it's pretty much the same. Canvas is a little more durable than sails. Um, you can be a little coarser with canvas than you can with sails. The same, soak them in uh, warm water. Uh, sodium per by per carbonate, which is OxyClean is the big one. Gentle brush, again air dry. And then I recommend spraying them with something like 303. You don't have to use 303. I actually had somebody tell me that they used uh, Thompson's water seal on their boat cover. It's the same thing. I, it's not actually any cheaper. They're both about $100 a gallon, so you don't save anything. Um, but they will protect from UV, and they'll help stop mold and mildew. This is a canvas sail cover here. These little black spots, this is some type of mold or mildew. It actually dissolves the canvas. So. The, these little black spots actually created little holes. So you want to really keep that under control. Oh, sometimes um, if you have a lot of Velcro on your canvas, the Velcro can hold a lot of water. Um, and you'll notice you might get mildew and mold and even moss. So down in the tropics, typically we will actually see moss grow around the Velcro. Um, you may not be able to scrub that off. In that case, you may want to actually pressure wash it because that organic material is far worse for the fabric than the process of pressure washing it. So occasionally, but try to brush it off first. Vinyl windows. So despite what we've learned in my big fat Greek wedding, Windex is not for everything. Uh, Windex has ammonia in it and ammonia reacts with the vinyl and it takes all the chemicals out of the vinyl that make it soft and supple. The vinyl will go cloudy, sometimes it will go completely uh, white. It will become brittle and it will crack. This one actually just came in today. So that's on a white table. You can see the, the vinyls actually turn red and it's split down the middle and that's probably the results of exposure to, wind, to ammonia or Windex. Vinyl's really sensitive. Don't get anything on that. Same thing with the, uh, there's two different types of 303. Uh, one for canvas and one for vinyl. So the one for vinyl is called 303 protectant. I think I've got it here. There it is. Also crazy expensive. Um, you can also polish your vinyl windows. If they're old and they're a little bit of UV damage, for example, they'll yellow a little. If they're still flexible, you can actually polish them. It's the same as the headlights in your car. You know, they get cloudy. It's the same process and it's the same, uh, same polish. Now, if you do do this, you're actually taking the original UV coating off the vinyl. So you really do need to, to spray it because they'll go cloudy again in another year. But if you polish them and then use the protectant every year, you could add two or three years to your vinyl windows. All right, we're almost there. Wow, I'm right on time, look at that. I'm gonna talk, I get asked a lot about recutting sales. You can recut sails. Are you guys interested in this? Do you want me to carry on? Okay. Um, I get asked a lot about recutting sails. You bought a sail, it doesn't quite fit. Um, you got a really nice sail, but it's from a different boat or what have you. Yes, but with the caveat that you can recut the sail, but it may affect the shape. Now, sometimes if it's a really nice sail, if it's a new sail that you've acquired, at that point, it's worth actually going through the trouble of reshaping the sail if need be. If it's an older sail, not so much. It's, it's a fairly expensive, time-consuming process. A really common thing that I see is a head sail that has been converted so that it can go onto a foil. So it's previously been a hank-on, and somebody has want, bought a furler, and they want to put it on the furler, 
And for whatever reason, whoever did the job hacks the top of the head off like this. So this is an example of that. This sail previously was hank on. They've cut the top of the sail off. So what you've done now is you've now created this huge amount of roach in that head sail, kind of like, or on the Genoa, sorry, much like the head sail of a catamaran. Now the difference is, is that catamaran sail has battens in it to keep its shape. Your head sail does not. So what will happen is when that sail is completely furled out, the leech will flop over and the sail will luff all the time, no matter what you do, it will never set properly. It'll just flap. And of course, if it's flapping, it's creating turbulence and you're not, you're not getting that lift that you need. So that's actually the same sail. So to fix that, what I have to do is I actually have to cut the sail from the head back about two thirds of the way down the leech of the sail. I actually take off quite a strip and then it will fly. So it's, it's about that much and it just tapers right down. And this is a fairly large sail. It was probably about 12 or 15 feet that I took off the edge and then redo the leech. The owner of this boat was like, I don't know, he's like, it's never quite right when it's all the way out, but if I, if I furl it in a couple of feet, it works great. I'm like, yeah, no, that makes sense. If you were recutting, what technology are you using to help you lay out your cutting pattern, or are you just, okay, so you're yeah. design. Yeah, typically what, I'll, typically what I'll do is, if I can, is I'll attach the, uh, the head to the end of the loft, and then I'll stretch it out until it stops flopping over. Because you can actually see it, if you stretch it out, like you saw the other one stretched out in my yard, the, that, that leech will actually fold over. And so wherever that edge is, where it stops folding over, I go about another foot. But they, you're not using lasers or... No. Even when guys are putting in towards the countertops these days, they've got 18 different angles of lasers measuring their angles. Yeah. No, but, one, if it's, if it's an older sail, it's a little different shape. I mean, you could do the math, but you would be no guarantee because that, I'm literally using the existing shape of the sail to get the, I'm optically get the optimum shape of the sail. So I, like going back to the first couple slides, I'm looking at that camber in the sail and I'm trying to get that camber in the right spot. It's a good question. And there's a lot to be said with that. A lot of the sails now are all computer uh, designed and cut, which is great. But sometimes when you put them together, they don't look like they're supposed to. And you do kind of still have to eyeball them. Well, it really says you're an artist, Dave. Well, there's a, there's a little bit of voodoo magic to it. There really is. I can talk about that later, too. Uh, um, spinnakers. So often you'd be, somebody will come in and be like, so my spinnaker ripped, you know, right across the horizontal line. Can you fix it? I'm like, I can. It'll probably cost you twice as much as a new spinnaker. When you're fixing a spinnaker, each damaged panel has to be replaced separately. Each, each one. So at North Cells, when I'm at North Cells, the, they, these huge, Spinnakers come in off on these big boats and they're like, oh, we, we, we ripped it. And, you know, the, the head guy will walk over and he'll go, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, new spinnaker. Like he knows, like that's going to cost you more than a new one. If it's one panel, um, the edges, sure. Uh, the reinforcing, this, that's what we're doing here. This one actually shredded at the bottom. This was a furling asymmetrical um, and it shredded at the bottom. That, that's not too bad. We could fix that. But if you've ripped more than five or six panels across a spinnaker, you're probably best just to replace it. I mean, you can put a patch across, but then the shape will never be quite right. So how many panels is that? Like how many panels do This is actually just a reinforcing patch, but it's probably 20. But they're this big. But in a spinnaker, the, they could be 15, 20, 30 feet long. So it's, and each one's got to get done. So you put one in, and then, you know, you take, one, take that panel out, and it's quite a process, so. If you're gonna do it right.
Okay, so now we're to the prize section of the program. Does anybody know how to test a spinnaker to see how if it's worn out or not? Does anybody know? No? No, because, well, and I don't want to give anything away. Think about it for a minute. It's a downwind sail, so it's, a, it's different than everything else we've been just talking about. What's that? Uh, yeah, that might. Uh, let me think. No, I think even a, even a worn out spinner could probably still hold water. But you're on the right track. Heat, bad. What's that? Can you really tell, uh, well, I would, no, not necessarily. You could have lots. Of, you could still have pinholes in the in the spinnaker, and it would still work. What's that? That's the closest. He said leaf blower, and the water was close too. So the way <laughs> it's the, the it's airtight. If you take your spinnaker and you can blow through it, if you can like blow a candle out through your spinnaker, it's worn out. So your, what's that? Right? Well, and a, but a lot of people don't realize that because it's a downwind sail, it's actually pushing. It's not working, it's not a foil like the other ones, it's actually catching the sail. So if the wind can pass through the sail, obviously it's not terribly efficient. And you're, you know I mean, you don't really worry about the shape of your spinnaker. That, that's, it's not super important because it's just, you know, it's a kite, right? There we go. Who is the, who is the leaf blower? So my, I'm a rep for Rolly Tasker, so they send us these lovely t-shirts made and they actually make these shirts and they print them in their loft. They all have America's Cup boats in the back. <laughs> all right. Who is the water? Who said the water? Close. All right, any other questions? A ruler? No questions? Anybody else? Um, yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, not terribly. Yeah, hang on. I'm going to go back to that picture. It's a good question. The question was, how do I check the camber? Um, one, it's not a huge priority, other than if the sail's very worn. Usually the owner of the boat knows if the boat, if the sail's fairly worn or not. Um, if it's, occasionally the sail will come in, it needs a fair bit of work, and I'll be asked, is it worth doing the, doing the work to it? Um, I can usually tell, actually, by the fabric itself. So once the fabric is kind of done, I can kind of tell just on the table just by touching it. I know that by handling it. And I can usually get, I can say, I, in fact, the sail that I showed you there that had the huge cent, uh, kind of center uh, camber, I didn't know it was like that until, like I knew it did, like I had done a patch on it 
And touching the fabric, I'm like, okay, this is a baggy sale. So I needed one for the picture, so I stretched it out so you could see that. But yeah, I would pull it out and have a look if it was a, if it was a question of whether to, con to fix the sale or not. I'd pull it out and have a look. The best thing, though, is bent on your boat. That's the best place. In fact, it's a good idea to actually set your sail like this, go close to the wind, get someone to drive, obviously, uh, and then lay on the deck and take a photo of it from the boom up. Gives you a really good idea of what the sail looks like on your boat. Anything else? Any other questions? Cleaning, fixing, material? That is part. Right. Yeah. The fabric's usually so worn by that point, it's just not worth it. Um, yeah. It, it's, it's possible. Sometimes, like a sale, uh, someone will order a sale and the camera's wrong. Um, we had a jib, brand new jib. Uh, this is down south. The storm jib came in and it was flat. We laid it out and it was completely flat. So then we had to put camber in it. But it was a brand new sale, so it was worth doing. So. How would you put camber back in something that is stretched? That has stretched? Yeah. That right now, if you look at that one, mm -hmm. the camber forces in, and it would it would straight like you would. Um, if it was flat? Yeah. Um, so that would be done mainly in broad seaming. So we would take the seams out. And we would uh, you overlap the seam a little bit, and it makes gives you that shape. Also, like sails when they're cut and they're flat, they're actually at the leading edge. They generally arc a bit like this. So when you pull them straight against your mast, that gives you some shape. So we just reshape them. It depends on the sail and its purpose and how it's cut, and but generally it can be done. It, we take these seams out right here, and we pull them in at the front and the back. And that leaves a little bit of shape in the middle. And the reverse if you're trying to flatten it out. Is that what broad seaming is? Broad seaming is just, this is a, just a broad overlap seam. So if the sail's got too much bag, we would pull the seam in in the middle. And that would flatten the sail out. I'm in Westboro. Um, I have cards up at the front. I'm at 181 Claire for now. We're actually looking for a bigger space for the loft because we've already outgrown our space. Um, so if anybody knows of a, you know, 4,000, 5,000 square foot space that somebody wants to rent cheap. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Can you talk about sales storage in the off season? Oh, yes. Sales storage in the off season. Yes, yes. Um, Yes, uh, there's, there's a few things there. As I said, dry. Good idea to like rinse your sails off. It's not so bad here in fresh water, salt water is worse. Um, rinse your sails, make sure they're totally dry. Uh, flake them or roll them. Laminates generally prefer to be rolled. Um, and then store them somewhere dry and vermin free. Uh, mice love sails. They will turn them into like snowflake cutouts. They'll chew right through them and then they'll have the courtesy to die inside the sail for you. Um, one, one thing, I use uh, downy sheets. I'll, I'll like to, I like to pack mine in an industrial garbage bag after I've dried them and I'll throw in a couple of fleecy sheets. Uh, the active ingredients in fleecy sheets is formaldehyde, which most living creatures really don't like. And it does work really well to keep the bugs uh, and the mice and mold and mildew out of your sails, especially if you've got to store them in a shed or an attic or a basement. Tom, can you think of anything else? Yeah, vermin's definitely a big one. Bugs and things, and they leave those little black spots in your sail too. Anything else? What about 
John. What about sacrificial spreader patches? And sort of, I guess those are go in the category of anti-chafe. Can those be serviced yeah. and yeah. replaced? Yeah, yeah, and they, um, yes. Uh, generally, they do need to be replaced. Um, and say boats, for example, with boom furling, not a lot of those here, but the bigger boats all use boom furling. Um, the rollers and the boom furling will actually shred the sails, so they put any chafe for those. And those have to be replaced almost every year on the big boats. So yeah, for sure. And there are different options for that too. Ge generally, we like to stick them on. We don't like to poke any more holes in the sail than necessary. Oh, I'm not storing in the dry the super dry area because it's stored on the boat. So is, how is the, to compensate for that when I, uh, uh, in the spring, um, is there any process that I can? Yeah, like I said, um, if you find that your sails are a bit musty, um, again, like it, whatever container your sail will fit in, again, warm water, even cold water, uh, quarter cup of OxyClean, so keep in mind, the OxyClean, it, it's a powder generally, it reacts to the water. So you have to mix them together. Um, and what it does is it just lifts dirt, but it doesn't affect the fabric at all. So it doesn't have any bleach in it. it, it but it will lift a lot of the dirt and stain. Is that hydrogen peroxide? It's uh, oh. sodium percarbonate. Oh, okay. Yeah, Works, it does work really well. Uh, to which intervals would you recommend that uh, the sails that are 10 years or, or, or older should be stitched? Um, I wouldn't restitch a sail unless it needed to be. Um, but like I said, if you, you, you can tell, uh, the sails will start, uh, usually they'll break at the tack first because they generally rub against the pulpit. So that's where you'll start to see the threads start to fail first um, or along the leech. But like I said, you go along with the pick, and check. Typically, the broad seaming um, here, that doesn't usually fail, Scott, but. <laughs> uh, but yeah, again, if, this, if the sail gets heavily stressed for some reason, like if, you're, if you get sailing some like 25, 30 knots and you're trying to reef and you're, you're cranking down on the sail, you could actually damage the threads. So you might want, if you have any wind or heavy loading events, you might want to check your sail after. Yeah, so there's a really good story behind that. <laughs> Where's the mic? <laughs> Mind I tell it? No, go ahead. Yeah, so. Hello, test one, two. Yeah, so uh, last year I was doing the solo sail with the uh, fundraiser here on the river. Uh, left here, uh, Nepean, put my sails up outside uh, by vacation. Uh, winds were from the west, so I tacked 57 tacks from here to Moore Island. Uh, six and a half, seven hours. I got as far as just past the uh, Green Boy going into uh, Constance Bay, uh, top of my sail. So right where the uh, number 32 is, roughly, that top part of my sail just tore right apart. The reason being, one, Dave talked about um, talked about old sails, bagged out sails, worn out sails, he can tell, and I'll touch a bit about that on later. Uh, so when I left here, I was like, okay, 20 to 30, gusting 35, okay, I'm gonna reef. I reefed. Uh, yeah, I didn't like the way my sails looked, so I unreefed, and I said, okay, I'm gonna sail that way, and and reef my foresail and reduce that there. So I had full sail, main sail up, half a jib out going up. It was comfortable. Solo sailing, it was fine. Uh, next thing you knew, I was like, but what I did was, and I didn't realize it at the time, number one rule about sailing in heavy winds is what? Flatten your sails. How do you flatten your sails? A little bit of halyard tension. Yeah, I over, I over tensioned. Old sails, begged out, worn out, Decided, yeah, I had enough, we're done. Ripped, wrapped around my forest day. It took me 20 minutes to get my sail down. Finally got it down, put the motor on, went to Morazal and called Dave, said, hey Dave, you got a, uh, a portable uh, sail machine? 
Oh, yeah, I do, actually. Where are you at? More on. Yeah, I'll see you Monday. <laughs> so that's what happened. So I brought my sale back in today. We, uh, we fixed it up so I can have a sale. And I actually bought a uh, Roly Tosker main sale. And, uh, yeah, it's a fantastic sale just yeah. for cruising. It's great. Yeah, you'll really notice that if you have a baggy sail, you'll really notice in heavy weather. It makes it really hard to control the boat. And like what you're talking about, it's a really common uh, way to damage a sail. I actually had one a couple years ago, again down south, uh, one of those big, beautiful gunboats, carbon fiber sails. And it was a charter, and they had a very windy day, and then they went out the next day, and it was beautiful. And big power winches, right? Put the, put the halyard on, and boom! Big carbon, you know, $25,000 carbon fiber sail, split it right down the middle, just pull it apart. So I also have another comment too. So when I took the sail over to, in the, to that day, I think I was off that week and I was helping you do some other sails and stuff. And I think we were repairing it. We were looking over everything, uh, poked. So pretty much that list he had in here, what goes wrong with sails, what needs to be repaired. Uh, I think I had three quarters of those covered with that sail. Yeah, it covered most of them. Pretty much, yeah. yeah we put yeah. a batten. We put a batten right through the end yeah, of it. Yeah, one of the battens went right through. Batten yeah. went. Uh, we had to reinforce the uh, the tack ring. Yeah, your webbing was gone. The yeah. webbing was yeah. gone on that. What else was it? Oh, a few yeah. patches we had to do. Yeah. That were just like it was just worn. Like you could literally see right through the sail. Yeah. I don't even know when how a, old that when sail a sail was. gets really bad. Um, even when you're able to patch it, the, the act of actually sewing the fabric will, will perforate it. So you get to a point where it's just not worth fixing them anymore. So, um, yeah, so like I said, I deal with Rolly Tasker. Um, I also um, am looking at using a cutting service. So I will, because I don't have enough space to do all the work myself, and it's very time consuming, and it becomes very uh, expensive to actually try to make a sale here. Um, but more and more people want them made here. So I now have a, uh, an account with a place in Vermont that's going to cut the sails for me and they'll ship them up in pieces. So if you wanted to have a specialized sail, you can order it, we can design it, we bring it up, and what I do is I tape them all together. And you actually get to see what the shape of the sail looks like. So we're actually kind of hoping that we can start doing some race sails for some of the fleets that are having trouble getting affordable race sales from the other big, you know, the big, the big sail makers. So that's something we're excited about coming up. So. Any other questions about fixing them or storing them or washing them or? These Chinese set of sales that they advertise, are, are the Chinese sales that uh, they advertise, you know, you know, order it in the fall and get it in the spring, mm -hmm. are they any good? I love them. Um, I do a lot of warranty work on them because there aren't any other lofts in the area. And I used to say terrible things about them. I don't anymore because they make me a lot of money now because <laughs> they, <laughs> they often need to be fixed. Right. I, you know what, it's, it, it's difficult now, and I'm, I'm, I'm only half joking. Um, it, it's difficult because I'm not sure what's happening in the industry, but uh, there were a couple of manufacturers in China that really did make really good sales and hadn't been making really good sales for 30 or 40 years. Um, but there's been like, uh, you know, the guy is the owner, the founder has passed away and the company's been bought or been handed down and the quality is just not quite the same. So um, we're also seeing it's, it takes a long time to get sales over from China for some reason. So it's getting longer, the lead time is getting longer and longer and longer. Um, I don't, I'm not like locked into anybody. I can sell, I can order sales from anybody. Um, I liked really Tasker, one, they're in Thailand, they're not in China. They order all their stuff from the US, so it's all Challenge, Contender, and Dimensional Polyan, who are lovely, I like working with them. Um, they ship it all over, they manufacture it there. Thailand pays their workers a fair wage. It's not as much as here, but they're, they're paid better than they would be in China. Um, and things are fairly stable. And really Tasker, they use UPS for all the deliveries. So they, they don't, there's no choice there. So they fly them to me. So I can have a sale in three weeks. I can put the sale in, you know, the order in on the first, and I've got it on the 18th or the 20th. So, and then the quality I'm getting, like the construction is really good. 
you know, there are other companies like Precision does a really good job. You know, they, they're here, they do a great job, they have a great product, the price point is very low. Um, the materials are generally all made in the same place in China. So everything is, the fabric, the thread, everything is made there, the webbing, and then they manufacture it there. Um, but again, the lead times are getting quite long. The only issue with ordering sales from a place like that is they come and then here's your sail, right? You put it on your boat and it's not quite right. Foil tape's in the wrong spot. The webbing is not quite right. The, the sail just doesn't quite line up right. What are you gonna do? You're gonna, are you gonna mail it back to China? So, which is why I get a lot of warranty work from um, the Chinese lofts because they don't wanna have to pay to send it back. Um, whereas Rolly Tasker, we have a relationship, so if the client wants something specialized, we work on that together. The loft, you know, they're working on price point, right? So they do, we do this. But the client wants something extra, they will send it to me, I will do the extra, and then I make sure it fits on the boat. So that's the difference. And that's the way sales should be made, right? The, it's like a tailored suit, right? You go in, you're fitted, they make the suit, you go in, they put it on you, and they make sure it fits. And that's the difference. It's that last step that's been missing in the industry for a very long time. So. We're, we're, we're trying to fix that. Now, fortunately, uh, Kingston Sail Loft is open again. So they're around. There's a loft still in St. Catharines. Um, there's one in Hamilton and there's one in Toronto, I think. But there's not many left and all these, I'm the young guy. There's, most of these guys are, yeah. Yeah, like Spike at Doyle, he's 81 or 82, so. Yeah, anyway, so we're yeah, looking at kind of doing a sale, sale making almost like a cooperative. So the, uh, the skipper can actually be involved in the process. So and hopefully as soon as we get enough space, we can set that up. So I'm actually doing a head sale for this boat this year. So we'll see how that goes. Yourself. Myself. Yeah. Myself. My boat. Yeah. Any other questions? I think we covered a fair bit of stuff there. Thank you.